first of all, thank you for all the great questions at the end of the previous talk. And uh, please, by all means, send in more. I know that we went through a lot of stuff and it was pretty detailed, but I wanted to also point out that the most important thing is to take the knowledge that you've learned and get started building memory palaces. It's incredibly fun and easy to do, and you have all the principles that you need, but the most important thing, as I said, is to get started and you learn by applying. And as I was pointing out in the silence that, <laughs> that we had for a minute there, is that 90% of people really never get past the first try. They give up. And if you become part of the 10% that tries for the second time, getting through any frustration that you may have, then you will be so far ahead of the game because you won't be long to that 90% of giving up. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind for anything that you do in life is the sort of 90% uh, people just sort of, eh, it didn't work the first time, so I will give up. So be part of that 10%. Give it a try and give it another try if it doesn't click the first time because it will click the second time. And if not, the third time. But just go with these things and overcome any frustration. And we'll talk actually about overcoming frustration that you may have as we go along. Now in this talk, I want to talk about how to use memory palaces in actual action, in actual practice, and how to use them to store knowledge because that's what this is all about. It's not just about storing facts and figures, but it's about storing knowledge and actually creating knowledge as you store the knowledge. So you get a number of effects. Your learning as you use memory palaces, you're memorizing what you're learning as you're using memory palaces, you're being able to recall what you've learned by using memory palaces and the techniques that we're going to get into, and you're also being able to see connections while you're doing this and to create new knowledge. Because when you're recalling material and you're bringing it outside of yourself, you're doing it in a particular context, and that context will always be different than the context in which that you memorize the material in the first place. So that sort of principle where you can't step into a stream, the same stream twice, you can't really recall information in the same way twice. Even though you can recall it verbatim and accurately, that context will change. You'll have new connections to, with, to draw from. And so even though it can be verbatim and the same, an actor on a stage saying the same lines is never really saying the same lines. He, he or she is in front of a different audience and the weather is different. Maybe their digestion is different because they ate something uh, strange, but it's the same and different. And that's really the principle of creating new knowledge is that you're always doing it in a different context. You're seeing different connections. And that has a lot to do with when you're writing out uh, long form answers on an exam that you're producing new knowledge and new connections, not so much if you're just answering one word questions or you have to identify terminology, but you inside yourself will have that effect. So that's what we're going to get into in this particular lecture, how to use memory palaces to not just store knowledge, but actually create it. And I also want to talk about why that Simonides story itself is actually memorable in the first place. Why has this story gone viral throughout history? Because it's not just the origin, so to speak, of memory palaces in the West, but it includes a number of the principles that we use inside of memory palaces to memorize information. So what are some of these principles? Well, the first is the principle of imagery. And this basically involves actually taking images and using our imagination to encode the information that we want to memorize by associating it with other things. So the first level is having a memory palace that you can use to associate locations in your mind, associate information with locations that have been strategically planned in advance for the purposes of memorizing information. And then to place that information so that it is memorable, we're going to use images. And we're going to use images in a particular way which is to exaggerate them, make them strange, make them large, make them bright, make them colorful, supercharge them in every possible way. And when I talk about this, I'm going to tell you how to not only do this, but uh, how to develop as an imaginative person, if that you're not already. The way that we do this and why that we do this is because we want to create something that I would call the rubberneck principle. And we've all had that experience where we're driving along the highway, and we see an accident, and we have to look. 
We just simply have to look at that. And we don't know why that we have to, but it's just so compelling to see that accident that we almost make new accidents because we're driving off the highway. We want to leverage that aspect of human psychology in order to actually make the things that we are seeing in our mind memorable so that we have this rubberneck effect that when we're walking through the memory palace, we have to look at that because it's so strange and exaggerated and wild and, and large. So that's the principle of imagery. We'll get some examples of that as we go along. The next is the principle of action. And this is actually putting action into the images. So you wouldn't want to see Michelangelo's David to remind you of something. You would want to see Michelangelo's David doing something. So he's engaged in action. And just as the images are large and vibrant and colorful and beaming really with energy, we want the action to also be exaggerated and filled with amazing intensity and zaniness. Absolutely as strange as you can get it. And you want to focus on that and really make that vibrant and present in your mind. And there are ways to, of course, do this. And one of them is just to focus on that. It doesn't really take that much time, but you want to have that as part of the element. People who don't succeed with this are usually not focusing, taking a few seconds to inject the images and the actions with energy, with vibrancy, with magnetism. And that's one of the reasons why I like to use the word magnetic memory method is because you are magnetizing this material when you're taking just a few seconds to inject it, really power turbocharge it with vibrancy. And so the principle is really to really, really, really exaggerate it. And this is done eyes open, eyes shut, however that you're comfortable with doing that. And you need to find your own style, your own approach to it. Mine happens to be very cerebral in many senses. It's very conceptual. And we're going to talk later with Robert Adut, and he has incredibly conceptual uh, associative imagery, which is what I call the combination of imagery and action together, associative imagery, because we're using it to associate things to. His material is also cerebral like mine, but there's still visual elements to it. So we'll talk about what to do if you're more of a conceptual person. And there's still ways to use imagery and action, even if you're not really seeing it. And I've worked over the years in order to make myself see it better mentally. And I'll share those processes with you, and they will work for anybody. So exaggeration. It's really, really important, whether it's conceptual or visual or a combination of both, to really, really, really see this stuff. So really it's not enough to see it in your mind. You want to create this rubberneck principle. So to give you an example, if we're using a man in a yellow t-shirt kissing an alligator to memorize something, that's just kind of funny, right? But this is a static image that we're looking at right now. There's no action in it. To make it much, much more memorable, to give it that rubberneck sort of principle, we would want to have all of these colors as beaming with energy as possible. We would want both the color of the man and the color of the uh, alligator or crocodile to be just be beaming with energy. Kind of like, you know, in the Matrix movies where somehow th the, the code is revealed underneath and there's this powerful light and the camera is spinning around with all these digital symbols and everything's just supercharged. You want to get that so sort of supercharged energy in here. And then you want action. So... I'm just using this as a sort of an example of something bizarre and strange that is sort of unforgettable. A man kissing this alligator, he's in great danger. There's drama and theater in the image, but it's lacking action. And you want the action to be bizarre. So there's something called congruity and incongruity. Congruity in this situation would be exactly what you'd expect to happen, that the alligator would bite off this guy's head, right, and make him lunch. That's congruous. That's just sort of what you would expect to happen. But something incongruous would be that the Statue of Liberty arrives and uses the alligator to swing around her head and then swings that guy around in, in her head and starts bashing them together and it explodes into a wonderful 4th of July celebration of fireworks. That's incongruous because that would never happen and it's just such a strange thing that the Statue of Liberty is there in the first place and she's beginning to use these really quite cartoonish violence images as part of helping you memorize something. 
And we'll get into some specific examples of how that works as we go along, but that's the principle. That's the sort of the actual procedure that you're going to use. Exaggerate it. So it's not just Statue of Liberty doing this stuff, but it's large and bright and vibrant and colorful, and the action itself is filled with energy. And I'm sort of repeating this again and again to drive home that point because it is so important, and it really takes only a few seconds to do that. But when you're traveling back in those memory palaces, the effort of just spending a few extra seconds on injecting it with this energy is going to pay off in a huge way as part of creating this rubberneck principle. You will have to look at it because you have magnetized this sort of stuff. You're also giving it personality. You're giving aspects of your personality because you're not going to come up with imagination material that comes from someone else's head. You're going to come from your own head. So the more you sort of focus on it and inject it with aspects of yourself, drawing from things that interest you and things that you know about from your culture, the more personal associations you're going to have for, for this and the better it's going to work, especially when you add this extra level. So the exponential power of combining location with imagery and action improves the odds of recall. It improves the odds incredibly, and you're giving yourself more chances because you have the location to draw upon. You remember the location, you remember your memory pal's journey, and you remember that you put something there. You remember that in the bathroom, even if it's just a small representation in the tub, you remember that there's a man kissing an alligator who's interrupted by the Statue of Liberty who starts swinging them both around in her hands and smashing them together, which turns into fireworks. And this is a second way of improving the odds. You can go to that place. You can, that's one way of improving the odds. You can then see this imagery. That's a second way of improving the odds. And then you can see the action. And you're bringing these sorts of things together. And these are not abstractions. These images are not abstractions. They are concrete material from which you can abstract or decode what you've tried to memorize. And I wanted to mention why that Simonides story has been so powerful. And it has all three elements. It has a location, it has action, and it has imagery. And the location is the banquet hall. We all know the idea of what a banquet hall is. We all know the idea of where one might be located on a street or in this case, on a hill, uh, which is, I imagine it being sort of like a fortress on a hill. And I have a very clear representation in my mind of what this banquet hall must have been like. And even if you don't see it visually in your mind, you probably have a concept of what a banquet hall in ancient Greece might look like. And you can just kind of picture in your own way what that might be like for you. And so there's a location and that location, the uh, very idea of thinking about a location of what a banquet hall might look like is premised upon your knowledge of what buildings are like in general. And you're able to draw upon that. So one of the reasons why Nimonides, or sorry, uh, Simonides' story is so memorable is that he, or the story itself, took place somewhere. So we can remember that. The other reason why it's memorable, of course, is because the image of a building collapsing has both very, very memorable elements to it. Wh when, we, when I talk about a building being a, a imploded with dynamite, you can probably see in your mind these images that are really, or these videos that are really cool on YouTube where you see buildings exploding. For some reason, they're, they're demolishing a building because it's gotten old and it's just... <laughs> we know what that sort of looks like. So the reason why I think that this story of Simonides and the origin of memory palaces has gone viral is because it has all of these elements to it. And by virtue of a building collapsing and people really dying inside of that building, we have exaggerated imagery built in. And we have drama and we have theater and we have characters and people. So that's really the way that that story improved its odds of surviving and going viral is by having all these key elements. And some stories don't have those, actually. So, you know, if you just start talking about a princess and a, a king and you don't give it a location, then that story is not going to be nearly as memorable as if you say, in the land of Sorigor, there was a king named Balidu and the princess. And you give them names and you give them locations. And when you know it's in a land taking place in a particular way, it already increases the odds of being memorable to you. And if you think about Harry Potter, it uses two locations to make the story much more memorable and involve you inside of them. So location, image, and action are very, very key parts of creating amazing 
memorable things for yourself. Now, the question that comes up all the time is, what if I'm not visual? And I struggled with this myself when I was first getting into memory techniques. And I found very quickly that you don't need to be visual. You can just think about images, and you'll already get a very, very positive effect. So you don't need to see in your mind the Statue of Liberty interrupting a guy kissing an alligator. You can actually just think about what that might look like or have the concept of what that might look like. And it's a very, very interesting way of beginning to get a bridge or a path into this if you feel like you're not visual. is just to concentrate on what it might look like and concentrate on putting that in a particular place. And when I first was developing this, I used to see this without color, just sort of like one of these characters from X-Men or from Spider-Man movies or whatever where they lose their color or the Fantastic Four. They lose their color and they're just transparent. And I used to just sort of see the outlines of things. And that was a step. The next sort of thing that I started to do was to draw upon things that I already knew. So, for instance, I know what Tom Cruise looks like. I don't really need to see a picture of him in my mind, but we all know, well, virtually everybody knows what Tom Cruise looks like, and it's a path towards creating things more visually in your mind. So if you feel that you're not visual, that you don't see things naturally in your imagination, you can hack the system, so to speak, by picking someone, Tom Cruise, Prince Charles, whoever may be predominant in your life and in your interests, and a celebrity or actor or author that you know who they look like, you can use them as a bridge to becoming more visual by getting an image in your mind and just focusing on filling in the details, actually creating an image inside of your imagination and working on developing that visual, eye, vi that visual capacity. And of course, you also want to practice seeing them in action. Now, where would be the best place to do this kind of activity? Would it be just closing your eyes and just in general seeing Tom Cruise? That may have an effect, of course. But a better place to do this sort of activity would be inside of a memory palace, of course, because that's where you're going to ultimately be placing this information, is inside of memory palaces. So instead of just picking Prince Charles to recreate in your mind, you would want to go into a memory palace and see Prince Charles in the memory palace and have him doing something strange, like perhaps kissing Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise punching him back because Tom Cruise is too much of a Scientologist to be kissing the prince. And you begin to see these sorts of people. And uh, you get general images, you draw upon general things, and sorry for the people on the camera, <laughs> we're here in the audience laughing at this idea of Tom Cruise and, and the prince kissing. But uh, move from the general concept, the people that you know, and allow the, to yourself to become more and more specific and practice within a memory palace itself these visualization exercises. Another thing that you can do that works well in combination with that is to, in addition to actually starting with a particular celebrity, is to actually cultivate a pool of actors and musicians and politicians, cartoon characters, the cast and crew of The Simpsons, famous people who are famous just for being famous that you encounter all the time sports figures and so forth, and pool them, deliberately collect lists of them. Wikipedia is fantastic for this. Lists of actors, lists of German actors, lists of Asian actors, lists of authors, lists of celebrities. You can just get pictures of people, and you can create deliberate lists, or you can just surf them with having in mind that you're collecting a pool that you can draw from. Because later, when you're memorizing from a textbook, or you're memorizing something in real time, which we'll talk about, you want to have some sort of visual vocabulary, and you want to be able to draw upon them. And actors are really great because why? We are used to seeing them in action. So we're not used to seeing still photographs that often of Tom Cruise, let's say, to continue using that action. Well, actually, we do see a lot of still images of him, but we always encounter them for the purposes of seeing him in a film. So he's in action. He's running, jumping, sweating, kicking, kissing, leaping, all sorts of things that 
people do in movies. So actors are really great because they're already engaged in actions and they're a very, very strong portal into seeing them mix with other elements in bizarre actions. Another thing that you can do if you don't feel very visual in creating associative imagery, in creating action and imagery in your memory palaces, is to take up drawing. And this is essentially what I did as I wanted to be able to see things better in my mind in addition to collecting pools of actors and so forth, which for, for me was very easy because I was a p film professor for uh, almost 10 years. The drawing, however, was something I took up when I was in Saarbrücken and I was teaching as a film professor with a research grant. And luckily I was two hours train drive from the Louvre, which of course helps if you want to take up drawing <laughs> to be able to be around all that great art. But every city has a museum or an art gallery that you can visit rather easily in order to engage with art and start sketching and drawing. And it doesn't really matter how poor you are. Even after four or five years of drawing, I wouldn't call my drawing skills exceptional, but that is, for me isn't the point. The point is daily engagement with visualizing. And so it's something that you can do and you can sketch. And one thing I always told my students in lectures is please do not take notes. Bring a recorder and review the material later, but if you're gonna do anything, sketch during a lecture and allow the visual elements of your mind to work in conjunction with the material that you're listening to. Uh, there's power in that. At the very least, it's worth experimenting with because writing notes is a cognitive exercise that you're taking place. You're using abstract symbols as you're listening to concrete ideas that are auditory. And one thing that I think is, has been much very powerful for me is to actually just listen to what's going on and to doodle. And you're breaking that connection between listening and translating and coding into abstract symbols in writing. You're actually listening to something and turning it into completely unrelated visuals and accessing different parts of your brain. And to take that to a totally different level if you want to do uh, hacking experiments with your mind is take up drawing with your other hand while you're listening to lectures and see just the kinds of things that that can do to your attention. It's really quite interesting. Studying art, of course, is part of learning to draw, but you can study art if you're not interested in learning to draw. You can study art by collecting books, by going to art galleries, looking at art on the internet, and this also connects back to collecting pools of actors or pools of celebrities and and sports figures and so forth. You can also collect pools of images. So recently I've been working on studying Dali paintings, which are totally fascinating to me and they are a bit too abstract for this, but I'm always trying to push to new levels to use material. But there are much more concrete painters. You know, Mona Lisa is a very concrete painting. There's nothing particularly surreal about it. You can use Michelangelo's David, who uh, I mentioned earlier, and just things that are very, very famous that you already know, but extend to more famous things like Velázquez and all kinds of other painters who are really using concrete stuff that we recognize and start to cul cultivate pools of art that you can draw upon later. You can also pay closer attention to the look of movies and TV programs. And we'll talk about using TV and movies later as memory palaces but just simply by beginning to pay attention more to how visual elements of film and TV are part of the message, part of the atmosphere and the metaphor of the story can make you a much more visual person. The other thing that's really nice about that is that you can rebuild the material in your mind. So when you're thinking about a great movie, I saw the latest X-Men movie the other day, and I just spent so much time after seeing the movie and the next day re-visualizing some of that amazing, vibrant material that just blew me away. And I was deliberately doing that, not only because I loved the movie and was completely fascinated by it, but just as an exercise to become more visual. There's a specific set of examples that will take you to the next level, which is to actually rebuild objects in your mind. This is a little bit more advanced, but if you were to sit in a room with a lit candle, you could close your, you could stare at the candle, so to speak, and allow this afterburn effect to build so that when you're closing your eyes, you see that effect of the candle, even though your eyes are closed. You could look into a light as well and close your eyes, and you'll begin to, experience what it's like to see things with your eyes shut because of this afterburn effect. The next step is to do it with an apple or a banana or an orange, whatever that you like, on a table, for instance, and to 
look at it and close your eyes and try to rebuild it. Try to rebuild that image with as much intensity as you can. And this is very, very powerful exercise. The table corner exercise goes into abstractions, which is to look at the corner of a table and study it, study the space around it as well, and close your eyes and try to rebuild it. These are steps that many people won't take, but don't be part of that 90% that, doesn't, that tries something once and doesn't feel an effect from it and gives up. Do it again and again and see how that affects your ability to visualize in your mind with your eyes closed. Now, the next step in developing as a visual person so that you can create these crazy images and see them very clearly in your mind are rotation and movement exercises. So I should mention and repeat that when you're rebuilding a candle in your mind or rebuilding an apple or an orange or uh, some sort of object or the corner of a table, don't just rebuild it in, in the void of your mind. Rebuild it in a memory palace so that you're associating the activity, the exercise, the drill inside of the place that you're later going to use. It's kind of like reverse kung fu. You study kung fu in a, in a uh, dojo, hoping you'll never use it on the street, and you're very good at kung fu in the dojo. Um, but what you want to be doing here is actually taking things from the street, so to speak, and rebuilding them inside of your memory palace so that later when you're outside in the real world, you're able to access that material very easily and from what you've built, unbuild it, so to speak, into information that you can use in real time. So th the, the kung fu metaphor is you never want to have to use those skills, even though you're really good in a, a dojo using them. But here we want to be inside the dojo of our mind so that we can use them when we're outside in the real world. So rotation and movement exercises then are to take an apple, let's say, that you've rebuilt in your mind. You're sitting, eyes closed, maybe your eyes are open as well. You can try both exercises and see it inside of a memory palace as you've rebuilt it and actually begin to turn it to its left, turn it to its right, turn it in a circle, move it up, move it down. That's the movement part of the exercise. Move it forward, move it around, and go in a circle around it, circle the other way. You may want to float around it. This sounds totally bizarre and strange, but it's actually incredibly powerful. I got the idea from Robert Asprin's myth novels. I don't know if you ever read those where a young apprentice has to learn how to manipulate space and matter. It's almost like a pre-matrix sort of novel with on a different planet and different dimensions and all this sort of stuff. But it was really, really interesting thing that I started to try and do as as someone reading this novel. And I thought, yeah, that is kind of powerful. Even though it doesn't give you magic as it did in the novel, it certainly does give you greater visualization potential. So these are really wonderful exercises if you're not visual and things that you can start doing today to become more visual. And again, I want to stress, do it inside of a memory palace, all of these exercises. Now, dream recall is another next level. It's really something that we can't get into in this course. I've written a training book about it, but in general, without having to read the training book about it, just simply w work on remembering your dreams. Dreams are incredibly visual, and they're also conceptual. So you're seeing things, but you're also seeing things that are bizarre and strange. And the best way to really start with dream recall is just to start writing down your dreams. Make the intention that you're going to write down your dreams, and then begin to start to actually make written records of what you've dreamed and focus then, use that material, rebuild it inside of a memory palace. And if you like to sleep in, then of course you can actually start to put your dreams inside of memory palaces so that you can go back to sleep without having to write them down and then write them down later. But that's another way of becoming much more visual and to use material from your own head, which allows you to start replaying little movies and seeing actions and amplifying them because dreams are already amplified. So that's another very powerful exercise in becoming more visual. So to sum up, you want to use action and imagery in ways that we're going to get into. I'm just getting into the principle here, give you some specific examples of action and imagery put together in, in practice, but you want to use action and imagery that you're going to place along these journeys that we talked about in the previous lecture in order to encode information so that you can recall it. And by being able to do this, we need to have visual skills. So I've given you a number of visualization exercises, and really the key point, because we want to be able to do this inside of memory palaces, practice inside of the memory palaces that you've built. 
So get started with studying a candle flame, rebuild that in your imagination using the afterburn effect, study objects, rebuild these objects in your mind. You can study art and create pools of associative imagery that you can work together with actors and so forth. And a key point here is use information that interests you because you want to draw from your real life and from your pool of interest. It, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to collect images that are totally uninteresting to you. So I think that a lot of people think, well, how am I going to find all this stuff? And it's just simply identify what you're interested in and see how that you can use it to develop these visual exercises and to create a pool of reference for yourself. So now we can move to questions. NJ, 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 he wants to know um, how would how would you, Anthony, rate memory palaces against other um, memory methods for learning new foreign vocabulary rapidly and with a high rate of retention? Well, to be perfectly honest, I have nothing against other forms of memorization techniques, except for that you can't use memory palaces inside of other memory techniques. However, you can use other memory techniques inside of memory palaces. And so that's a very, very good question. And I know that there are a lot of people who really feel that they don't want to use memory palaces and they don't get any effect from it, and they're perfectly fine without them. And I congratulate those people because that's amazing. But some people that are trying this, they don't have the potential or they don't have the effect of having any quick victories actually being able to do this and it's because of not using locations locations are things that we don't have to remember we don't have to recall them because we know them so i think it's the superior grounding because they're concrete they're not abstract so many other memory techniques are incredibly abstract they involve hooks and stories that just sort of float somewhere in your mind and you don't know where to start because you don't have a starting point. You haven't anchored it anywhere. So the first thing that I would do if I were going to start with a new language, I would build memory palaces with that language in mind. I would have specific goals about how many words I wanted to memorize per day, in what order, uh, de determining sequences of importance and strategizing. And then I would use memory palaces because I don't want to be thinking, okay, I memorized these 10 words and I used a linking method and the first thing was, well, I may come to it if I'm doing them very well, but I just want to go to the memory palace. And I know that I was using a number of familiar locations. I was using them strategically and start there and have a place to go rather than having nowhere to go. So I think that that's why they're superior. It's because they're actual, they're premised upon what we already know. You always want to have a sort of scale where you're using what you know in effortless ways or nearly effortless ways to get to what you want to remember because you do know it you've just translated it so you start with location that you know and then you go to a, a station inside of that location that you also know and then you because you've done this exercise with bizarre imagery you 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 you're, you you find that imagery you know where it is so that's the reason why I think it's superior. And if you wanted to use other memory techniques, the first thing I would recommend to anybody is just to simply use those memory techniques inside of another, inside of a memory palace. Just as we're rebuilding apples inside of memory palaces, use other memory techniques inside of memory palaces and just give it a try because until that you've tried it, you wouldn't really see that sort of power. In the same way that you would never understand how Arnold Schwarzenegger feels after doing all those push-ups or those weightlifting exercises unless that you've done them yourself. So. Give that a try. Alrighty, the next question is from Kirsten from Canberra, and she wants to know, <coughs> could you, um, I mean, you've been in the business for a couple of years, right? And uh, could you <coughs> tell some stories, success stories from, from your students who, 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 were, who, <coughs> who managed to improve their memory, right? And what people are doing afterwards, after the training? Yeah, um, that's a great question, and I actually have some material prepared for that. But in brief, I get really dozens of emails every week with stories of people who, not just success stories. Uh, the success stories, to me, are ne never nearly as interesting as the stories of people who are on the path and who are working along 
in order to get small victories and they're seeing how it works. So, for instance, the guy who came up with this idea of apartments with compartments, he was incredibly incredibly inspiring to me because I could see him working. And he was 80 years old, this man, and he was just having so much success once he got past that barrier of the word memory palaces and he came up with the idea of apartments with compartments. It clicked for him. And then he was telling me about memorizing Gray's... Uh, I, I, I didn't remem- remember the, the title, the exact title, because I wasn't memorizing it myself, but it's Elegy in a Church Courtyard or a title of that sort of nature. And he just said, I have memorized this poem that I've loved my entire life because of being able to use these techniques. And there were other things. And he made advances in his German vocabulary as well. And he would email me and he'd say, I struggle with this particular word. I don't know why it won't work with this word. And I just sort of through email coached him through it a little bit, and then it clicked. So that's a story of success. But the, the important thing is, is that he did make achievements, but that he kept going. He really wanted to master this. And so he had a number of barriers. And the first barrier was, what is he going to call these things? And he came up with apartments with, f- uh, apartments with compartments. And that's tremendously exciting for an 80-year-old person. Another sort of example, quickly, is uh, a young student who was struggling with chemistry terms and emailed me, and I was able to coach him through success I- in order to be able to recall these terms. And it was also chemistry and biology, and he wasn't sure how to separate these things in his mind in the most effective way. And, you know, without giving all the tools away, I'm very much of a teacher that says, here, here's the boat, here's the, the tackle, here's the fishing rod, put them toge- you put them together in this way, and I kind of let people do it. And that's the exciting story, is when people actually do this. They become part of the 10% that tries it again and again until they get that traction and don't give up, because it absolutely works. And we're gonna, I'm going to give more specific examples, especially with people who have used these techniques with foreign language vocabulary to show you not only what can be done and the, f- the, the change that it's made in people's lives, but actually the time in which that you can do it because the time frame uh, is, is very, very interesting and the speeds at which you can acquire vocabulary and information is very inspiring. So there's a little bit, bit more stories, but those are two things that come to mind as a young person and an older person s- seeing major success, the point being that they took action and through action they learned and were able to achieve their goals. Susan from Iowa, she wants to know, uh, could you elaborate the relationship, interrelationship between um, uh, between memorization and having a good memory on the one hand and really understanding something, right? So she's viewing um, the sh- just memorizing stuff and facts. Um, she, d- she doesn't really know if it's uh, the first step to understand something really deeply or is it on is it on the other side of a, of a scale how how do those concepts in in learning something relate to each other but one of the best reviews i ever got of one of my books was someone who said this guy is teaching us to do more with memory than just random digits because a lot of people get turned off from this kind of work, memory work, because they go in on the internet and they hear about these guys who are memorizing 200 digits of pi, and they can't get this connection to it. Because you can memorize stuff that's just information. Numbers from pi is, the use is extremely specialized if you're going to use it, and it's limited, and it's memorized for the purposes of championships and for competition. And that is just memorization without knowledge. But in terms of foreign language vocabulary, for instance, well, that also is at some level just information. But what turns into knowledge is using it and actually seeing how it works with other words, seeing how it causes effects in your life when you recognize a word and you're able to penetrate meaning and feel that meaning, understand what it means, understand what it could mean, and communicate with other people. That becomes knowledge. That becomes experience-based knowledge that's premised upon something that's in your mind. And one could say that in order to have something memorized, you have learned it. And in order to learn something, you have to memorize it. But that's not exactly true. And you certainly have learned something about pi 
if you've memorized all those numbers, but have you learned pi? Well, that would be impossible, right? Because pi never ends. But the really the heart of the question has to do with how that you're using what you've memorized. So if you go in with the spirit of, I just need to recall a bunch of formulas, or I just need to have this, this vocabulary to pass a particular exam, if you go in with that spirit, then it really just is information for a specific purpose. But if you go in, as I have done, and I'll, sh I'll show you this later, when I wanted to be very, very confident about what I had written and researched about in my dissertation, I created knowledge by being able to say at the time in great detail what Aristotle and Derrida said about friendship. And because I went through these steps, it wasn't just that I memorized what they said, but I was connecting what they said. I was able to riff upon it, so to speak, like you would on a guitar. You, you play it like an instrument, and you make new knowledge because as you're relating something, as I said before, you're relating it in a new context. You're responding to things. So it's really giving it life and you're producing it from memorization, and you're actually memorizing it from knowledge when you're memorizing from a book.